All right, so we are going to keep moving through our animal diversity. So here's our overall phylogeny of the different phyla that we're going to go through. So we talked about Perfora, Tenophora, and Idaria. We've already covered those. So this video is going to be covering um, Phylum platyhelminthes. So we're going to kind of jump all the way down here. Um, and if we want to kind of review a little bit, these platyhelminthes, these are going to be the first organisms that are going to be bilateral. So it means that they're going to be bilaterally symmetrical, um, which is really beneficial for movement. If you're swimming in water or if you're moving on land, it's more efficient to have that bilateral body symmetry as opposed to being circular, like we see in the perfra or the cnidaria. Um, the other thing that is going to be present in all of these groups, from platyhelminthes, everything else that we're going to be talking about, is going to be triploblastic, meaning that it's going to have those three tissue layers, the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. Right? The endoderm creates the lining of the gastrovascular cavity. The mesoderm is where we derive the muscles from and the connective tissue. And the ectoderm is the outer layer, the skin, the protective layer, as well as the nervous tissue. Okay. So we are going to talk about platyhelminthes first. Okay, but before we talk about platyhelminthes, let's talk about what this word means right here, lophotrochozoa. Um, I love to say this word, lophotrochozoa. <laughs> um, so lophotrochozoa, um, it's a different source is called a clade, some call it a superphylum. We're going to stick with the idea that it's a superphylum. So the first group we're going to talk about platyhelminthes again, these are lophotrochozoans. And what that means, superphylum lophotrochozoa, um, it was originally identified by molecular data, um, but there also are some morphological characteristics that keep this group kind of more tightly knit together as opposed to some of the other groups. Um, so superphylum lophotrochozoa, that means that usually they're either going to have a lophophore feeding larvae, or excuse me, lophophore um, feeding aperture, like we see right here. Um, so these tentacles that are stretching out that surround the mouth that allow them to catch materials and bring them in, that was what we call a lophophore structure. Okay, so this would be in an adult stage where they would have that lophophore. Um, other members of superphylum lophotrochozoa have what's called a trochophore larvae. Okay, so this kind of weird um, diamond-shaped larvae with two rings of cilia right here. Um, this is called a trochophore, trochophore larvae. Um, so usually members of superphylum lophotrochozoa, of which platyhelminthes is a part of, will have either a lophophore, trochozoa will have this lophophore or this trochophore larvae. Okay, and so we'll be talking about other members of this group later on. So phylum platyhelminthes. So plat or platy means flat. Same root word as plateau or like platypus that have a flat tail. Okay. And helminth is a general term that means worm. So worm is not a class, uh, not a true classification. It's a reuse, It's a word just used to describe a general shape of an animal. Okay. So these are the flat worms. Okay. So they have that long, thin, elongated body. That's what really we mean by worm. Um, so they are bilaterally symmetrical, they're triploblastic, um, but they lack a body cavity. So that space that helps protect their inner, inner organs, they don't have that. Okay. Um, so we call them acephalomates. And this is the first group that we see that has cephalization. Um, so cephalization meaning that they have a concentration of sensory organs in their anterior region, sensory organs as well as nervous tissue in their anterior regions, which is helpful if you're swimming around to keep all the important stuff up front so that way you can detect your environment, you can sense what's going on, and then make adjustments to your behavior as needed. Um, they have a single opening to their gastrovascular cavity. So um, very similar to what we saw in the Nidarians, the quote unquote blind gut um, materials is going to be moved, brought into the um, to the flatworm through this structure that we call the pharynx, which basically they use to kind of suck up food um, into their mouth and then into this really highly branched gastrovascular cavity through here. Okay. Um, so these organisms la lack a circulatory system, um, and so their flat shape, that really thin, long, flat shape, helps them to exchange materials with their environment directly through their skin. Okay, So they do not have any sort of circulatory system, so things are going to be moving around them directly through diffusion. Um, and that 
flat shape has a really high surface area to volume ratio, which makes it really efficient for moving materials across their skin. Okay. And they help to regulate their osmotic balance with these proteinephedria or flame bulbs, which basically just to help um, pump in or, or out solutes in order to keep their, their concentration, their osmotic balance. So we're going to be talking about two groups of um, platyhelminthes, catenulida, um, or the chain worms, and then the rhabdo, rhab, rhabditophora, um, the more diverse, um, and these include many, many free living as well as parasitic species. Okay, this is the rhabdi, rhabditophora <laughs> are the more common group for the platyhelminthes. So the catenulida, the chain worms, um, these are the these are free living. There's only about 100 species. There's not a whole lot known about them. Um, they're fairly small. They're all aquatic, um, and we call them chains, um, chain worms because they have these little segments here. And what these segments, what these pieces represent, is pieces that they've gone that they've created through asexual reproduction. So they will divide themselves what we, through what we call peritomy, which means dividing them um, per perpendicular to the anterior posterior axis. Um, and then that division that they create um, through peritomy develops into a new genetically identical organism, um, but it remains attached to that original species until it develops um, and goes through some amount of development so that way it can live on its own. So they often will live like chains like this, which is why they are called chain worms. Um, so again, they're mostly aquatic. We don't know a whole lot about them. They're typically eating small invertebrates or algae. Um, the other group of platyhelminthes, rep Reptidophora, um, these are the, so we have both free living and parasitic species. Um, the most well known of this group, the planarians, like this one right here that we'll be looking at in lab, Ducasia. Um, these are free living, um, they live in fresh water, they're going to prey on small animals, sometimes they're eating detritus. Um, they have eye spots, which help them to detect light so that way they can move um, either towards or away from the light. Okay, so kind of like we saw in Euglena, they don't really see any sort of detail with these eye spots, so just detecting is light there or is light not there. Um, these are really interesting in the sense that they are hermaphroditic, but they can also reproduce asexually. So if we were to cut this planarian in half, separate its tail end from its head end, both of those pieces could regenerate. So the tail end um, that is now lacking a head could regrow a head, and the, the head region could regrow a tail. Um, so they can reproduce, they can um, do this on their own, or if they're damaged they can, and they're broken in half, they could regrow as well. Okay. So these are some of the free living species. All right, so some of the parasitic species of platyhelminthes. Um, these are uh, these trematodes are the first group. These are often called blood, blood flukes or liver flukes. Um, <clears throat> they have multiple hosts usually. These trematodes, they're going to have um, an intermediate host is usually a gastropod, an aquatic snail, um, where their um, ciliated larvae will enter into this their snail host and then go through asexual reproduction in their snail host. Once they go through asexual reproduction in their snail host, they're going to exit the snail and they're going to be a motile larvae. So this motile larvae stage right here, this is a stage that can enter through human skin that is not damaged. So they have the ability to burrow through human skin. And then once they make their way into that human skin, uh, and once they make their way into that human skin, they typically make their way through the blood system, through the circulatory system, um, into the liver first. The liver is going to be their first stop. And then they mature in the liver. And then once they mature, the males and females um, stick together like this. So the females sit inside of this groove of the male. And they're going to stay like that for their entire lives. And they're basically continuously mating and producing fertilized eggs. Um, but after they mature and they create this structure with males and females combined, they typically move um, to different areas of the body, Different depends on the species, where they're going to go. A lot of them are going to move to uh, the digestive system or the renal system, the kidneys, uh, because most of their eggs, most of their fertilized eggs, are excreted by humans um, through feces or, or urine. 
Okay, and so that's how this parasite tends to be spread, is through infected water, and especially skin coming into contact with infected water. Um, so these trematodes, um, uh, schistosoma is the genus um, that th these trematodes are in, and they infect roughly anywhere from 200 to 300 million people each year. And once they are in their human host, um, they can live there for upwards of 10 years, undetected by the immune system, because they, they have this ability to mask the human immune system, and they can produce chemicals that will basically dampen the immune response. And then um, the other group of parasitic platyhelminthes, the tapeworms, these are typically um, parasites of vertebrates. Um, they do not have um, a gastropod or a snail as an intermediate host. Um, their life cycle, is they tend to um, be spread from humans through infected eggs that are excreted in feces to either a cow or a pig. And then they will insist in the muscle in the muscle tissue of that cow or pig, and then humans will eat that infected meat. Um, or humans, if they come into contact with water that is infected with these eggs, um, then they can also get these tapeworms as well. Um, so no invertebrate um, intermediate host. So this, um, most tapeworms, there are many species of them, but most of them have some sort of mouth structure like this. Um, well, this is not a true mouth. They're not absorbing nutrients directly through the structure. This is just their anterior region right here. We call this entire region a scolex. And it has a ring of hooks that they use to attach themselves to the intestine of their host. And then these suckers um, help to provide some extra attachment force. So it's these hooks and these suckers that allow them to attach themselves into the internal, into the intestine of their host. And then they don't have a digestive system. They don't have a mouth. They just directly through the entire length of their body, they're directly absorbing nutrients and food and whatever they need to survive. Okay, so again, they don't have a circulatory system. These actually do not even have a mouth. They're just directly absorbing straight from the intestinal tract of their host all the nutrients that they need to survive. And the way that these eggs are spread, um, these pieces, these segments right here that are called proglottids, these are the reproductive structures. Um, so these are also hermaphrodites. So these um, tapeworms are hermaphrodites, which means that in each of these proglottid sections, they have both male and female gametes, and that they're fusing. Those male and female gametes are fusing in these proglottids. And then once these proglottids are ripe, meaning that the eggs have formed, they'll be separated from the tapeworm, from the adult tapeworm, and then they'll be secreted in the feces. And then that continues the life cycle. Typically, um, proglottids secrete the eggs into water um, or on land, usually water, and then they come into contact. Um, with their next host, either a pig or a cow, or potentially another human could drink contaminated water with these species. Um, tapeworms can live inside of humans for upwards of 40 years, um, but we do have medications to treat um, these tapeworm infections. And uh, milk does not work. There's an urban myth out there. You can put milk under your nose, the tapeworm will come out. That's not how it works. Um, but yeah, so tapeworms can be treated um, with some common medications that we have. All right, so that is Phylum platyhelminthes. Again, they are acelomates, they are triploblastic, they're the first ones that we start to see cephalization in. Many are free living, um, but many also are parasitic. Uh, 